We now have a lot of evidence from cognitive psychology that this begins at a very early age, perhaps as early as age two or three. I, I'll just... But the young children treated them all as super smart. They know everything. And then with age, by the time they're about seven years old, they're actually starting to discriminate amongst all of these different agents. Um, which ones are the smart ones? Which ones don't know so much? <laughs> which ones really are, are even dumber than people? And they start discriminating that already by age seven. I, I'll just give you one experiment among many. Uh, Jesse Baring's research with little children uh, who are brought into a room and they're given one of these little balls with Velcro on it and you throw it at the dartboard and it sticks on it. That's the goal. So they're brought into the room, but they're not allowed to just do that with their good hand. They're turned, they're turned around and they have to do it backwards. So they're really bad at it, as any of us would be. And, and then the experimenter leaves the room and, and he says, just do the best you can and come out and tell me how you did. So of course they all walk up there and just stick it on the thing, right? All right, part two of the experiment. Uh, the little children are brought in and each of them is told, right next to the dart dartboard is a chair here. On the chair is Princess Anne. She's an invisible princess, and she can see everything you're doing. Experimenter leaves the room. All of a sudden, the children stop going up to cheat. The shadow of enforcement, the, the sort of infusion of agency in, of an invisible being in a chair that sees what we do, keeps track of our moral behavior, begins at a very early age. Our brains have evolved this capacity for agency. That's the earliest God beliefs we can't help but to imagine God as essentially a divine version of ourselves. When we conceive of God, we unconsciously, innately, impose upon God our own personality, our own virtues, our own vices, our own strengths, our own weaknesses. We project upon God our own biases and bigotries. We implant in God human characteristics, human personality, human desires, all along with, human, with superhuman powers. And so as a result, what we really do, again, whether we're aware of it or not, is we divinize ourselves. Okay, next line of evidence. Here's what happened about five to seven thousand years ago. These animistic, simple God beliefs and sort of social religions that evolved to help us uh, live together as a social primate species began to break down as populations grew from a couple dozen to a couple hundred individuals to thousands, tens of thousands, millions of people in state societies, from bands and tribes to chieftains and states. We needed some more formal means of behavior control and enforcing the rules of social cooperation. Two institutions evolved for that, government and religion. Government says, here's a copy of the rules, everybody gets one, and here's the punishments if you break the rules. Religion says, if you think you got away with it, and you cheated the state, nah, -uh. there's an eye in the sky that knows all and sees all, and in the next life, justice will be served. That's a very powerful force for social control. Uh, that there is this creator God that's super powerful and super knowing and immortal. It doesn't mean that children are naturally believe in only one God, or believe in God of the Christian tradition, or something like that. That's not the case. They just have an amazing conceptual receptivity to it, as if it's sort of just waiting for the right cultural input to sort of be locked in there. But that doesn't mean they're going to believe in one and only one God. In fact, it looks like we humans are naturally predisposed to think about lots of different supernatural beings. If you believe in God, then what you believe in is something that is by definition, utterly unhuman. And so the question becomes, how do you talk about that thing? How do you think about that thing? How do you form a relationship with something that is utterly unhuman? Well, the way you do so is by humanizing that thing. In fact, the entire history of human spirituality can be viewed as one long, intimately linked and remarkably cohesive narrative in which human beings increasingly humanize the divine. Until, of course, in the person of Jesus, God literally becomes a human being. That, I think more than anything else, explains why Christianity 
is the most successful religion in the world because in a way it, it scratches an unconscious itch that we all have.